and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's message is the Gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 2. Kingship in our country is a non-starter. Nearly 243 years ago, our ancestors fought the Revolutionary War in order to throw off a king. In our country, we value freedom and we want to lead lives where we can have a say in what happens and we can express our will and our way. Sometimes people want to take from us that which we have, our freedom, and it is ultimately a frightening idea to have that freedom taken away, either little by little or even by force. That a king might come into our country and be able to carry out his wishes without regard for the wish the desires of the people would make us angry. We don't have this situation in our lives. We live in a democracy, and in a democracy, the people have a say. They can express what they want. They can even express what they would like and in the priorities of their government. In our form of government, the government, the leaders, are limited by the Constitution. The Constitution says to the government, you can go so far and you can go no further, and this is to preserve the freedom of the people. We agree. We agree to live together by the rule of law rather than the command of the king. For us, especially as Americans, the idea of royalty controlling our country from the top down is repulsive, and we work hard to keep our freedom. And we celebrate those who gave their lives to preserve that freedom. King Herod, from our gospel lesson this morning, he had a similar kind of concern, a similar kind of fear. His fear was that a king had been born who would challenge his power, who would challenge his authority and his ability to lead his people. He was the king. He had a little bit of control in his corner of the world. And for anyone to come and challenge him was as uncomfortable as a king trying to establish himself in our country. He had wealth, he had power, and he had influence. For him, to lose these things would be to lose life itself. The scriptures reveal that Herod wasn't the only one who was troubled, though. The scriptures reveal that even all of Jerusalem was troubled. And, of course, this, these people in Jerusalem would be concerned because Herod was their king. And when Herod the king is unhappy, so the people are concerned about their own welfare and their own happiness. They're concerned about the stability of the place in which they live. Everyone knew their boundaries and lived and worked within those boundaries. Even the Jewish leaders. They also fell into line under Herod. Though Herod was in cahoots with a foreign government, the Romans, they had certain privileges and honors under King Herod. So when Herod heard this rumor from the Magi that a king had been born in Bethlehem, he didn't want to take any chances. He called to himself the chief priests and the scribes of the people to tell him exactly where this king would be born, and they told him in Bethlehem. So he decided to eliminate the competition. He would take no chance that some would come and upset the balance of power in his kingdom. And so we have the festival of the martyrs of the holy innocents. Because Herod pursued and killed all babies two years, and all male babies two years and younger. The Magi, those who had come from the East, had an entirely different view of the birth of this new king. They believed what they studied from the prophetic scriptures, and they turned their lives upside down and all around, and they left the place where they lived, where they worked, where they studied, and they pursued this new king. They didn't know what would happen. They weren't certain of anything in this trip. They simply desired to find the king prophesied in what they discovered in their studies. Their journey lasted from the time when Jesus was born until he had become a young child. And it wasn't a simple or easy commute. It was a challenge. It was a challenge for them to pursue this king. It was a challenge for them 
to go to the place where they could worship this king, but they did it. And the scriptures reveal that the Magi rejoiced greatly when they saw the star rise and settle over the house where Jesus was living with his parents. When they found the place, they fell, fell down and worshipped the child, a seemingly powerless little child. And they brought him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, gifts that were fit for a king. What about you? Between King Herod and the Magi, who are you most like? Are you most like King Herod, who was frightened by the prospect of a king who would come and, a cha and challenge his authority? Or are you like the Magi, who based simply upon the revelation of prophetic scripture came to worship Jesus? Sometimes it's easy for us to get comfortable in our lifestyles and not include Jesus. It's easy to get comfortable with sin. We want to rule over our own lives, and we certainly don't want some king to come and tell us what to do. I am me, and I know what is best for me, and nothing will ever change that, we might say to ourselves. When Christ comes to us and makes himself present, then, instead of embracing him and desiring fellowship with him as our king, we resist. We work hard to leave him out, or we even do violence against him. His presence in our lives is a threat. It is a threat because to commit ourselves to God means that there is ultimately another authority, one who is greater than I am, and he is God, and I am not. And this can happen when things are going well for us. We look at our lives and we puff our chests and proclaim to ourselves, look at me, look at what I've done and accomplished. I did it my way. I am powerful. The things are going smoothly. I'm in control. When life is good, we might give little thought to God. We want to take credit. In fact, we might take on this little attitude. What would God have done without me? We might not speak it. We might not say it. But it is in our hearts. At other times, it might be easy to follow and worship the Lord. There do come times in our lives when we do realize that we have a great need, a deep need for God in our lives. This comes most when life is difficult. There are moments in our lives when we do realize that we are not in control of what happens and that we have no choice but to concede to the Lord. Sometimes this comes as we realize our evil. It becomes so evident that no matter what I do, there is evil standing right there beside me. Sometimes I know what is wrong, and I do it anyway. And sometimes I cannot see any other options except the evil options that present themselves. It is in these moments when God's law convicts that all of us come to realize that we need someone to come to us. We need someone to come to us and to change us from the outside because we can't do it ourselves. We're not, in fact, king of our own lives. I cannot defeat evil on my own. I cannot be good unless I am changed. Another time when it's easy to understand that we have a king is when we experience disease or injury. We go to a doctor in our human way to try to control pain and suffering to take it away and even to take away death but to no avail we might get angry and harbor resentment against god but this in itself is indeed an acknowledgement of god we must realize that god is the one who gives health and life and god is also the one who is in charge of death and when death comes there's nothing there's nothing that we can do. In these times when we face the challenges of life and death, it is truly evident that I am not king of my own life. We might come to this realization slowly and even painfully, but we cannot in the end avoid the reality. To overcome death, we need a savior. We need a king. We need God. I found a little story that reminds me of how this works. 
story was told by a man named Henry Newman. Once upon a time, there was a little river that said, I can become a big river. And it worked hard to get big. But in the process, it encountered a big rock. And it said, I will not let this rock stand in my way. And so the little river pushed and pushed until it finally made its way around the rock. Next, the river encountered a mountain. I won't let this mountain stop me, the river said. And the little river pushed and pushed until it finally carved a canyon through the mountain. Next, the river came to an enormous forest. This forest is not going to stop me, the river said. And the river pushed and pushed until it made its way through the forest. The river, now large and powerful, found itself at the edge of the desert. And the river said to itself, I will not let this desert stand in my way. I will get through it. But as the river pushed and pushed its way across the desert, the hot sand began soaking up its water until only a few puddles remained, and the river was quiet. And then the river heard a voice from above. My child, stop pushing. I've got you. The sun then lifted the river up and turned it into a huge cloud. And the wind carried the river across the desert where it rained. And it watered the fields and made those fields green and lush. These fields that produce good food for people to eat. In all of your life, God is at work. Sometimes you are the strong river with a great confidence in yourself and your abilities, but at another time you are a weak trickle. No matter where you are at in your life, God is at work. Sometimes that work is hidden and unknown to you. Sometimes it's a surprise. The results of what God does, though no matter what, whether you see them or whether they're a big surprise, are blessings beyond imagination. The Magi came to Jesus when he was a little child. It's inexplicable to me why the Magi would come to Jesus. From their reading, they knew he would be a little child. They knew that this king was a powerless human being. But they simply read God's word, and that reading of his word changed their lives. It changed their course. For them, wisdom was seeking out the promised Messiah in whatever form he would take. For them, wisdom was submitting to a little child born in Bethlehem. For them, wisdom was dropping everything to seek out this mystery and to learn as much as they could about that mystery. They didn't know what Jesus would do. They didn't understand the full ramifications of his coming. They didn't get that he would die on a cross to pay the price for their sins, who, they, they who were even Gentiles. But they came, and they dropped everything to seek out this mystery and to worship this king. And this can only be the work of God. This was a transformation in the life of the Magi. It is something that is a miracle. It is something that could be done by no one other than the Lord by his word. I give thanks that God has also come to you. As you have celebrated Christmas and as you have come to church to hear God's word and receive the supper today, you are a transformed person. It's inexplicable how God's word has changed you also. You do not know the unexpected things that he will do with your life as your king. He loves you, and he will use his power fully for your benefit. He will use his word to give you the transformation of life that you need, and he is always with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand.